I'm Jessica. I lead growth at Aragon and very excited to talk about our team staking initiative that we just launched uh, last week uh, at, at Aragon. So we have um, Anthony, the CEO of Ar- Aragon from our team here today to talk about the initiative. We have uh, Lansky from Dapnode. Uh, we have Brett and Max, Max from Obol. And we have Myron Dennis from Diva. Uh, so we can start and get started talking about the initiative itself and just introducing what team staking is. And I'd love for Anthony to introduce uh, the initiative because I was his brainchild and he's the one who kind of drove it into existence. So just to tell us more about the idea and the why behind it and how he pulled everyone together to, to make it happen. Great. Um, thanks, Jessica. Um, I'm glad to have so many great people here. Um, I'm brief intro. I'm Anthony, the sort of new CEO of Aragon, although I've been working um, within the project for two and a half years now. Um, obviously, we have been offering DAO tooling um, since 2017 um, and have, I think now it's $27 billion in TVL on some of our contracts. We launched a, a new tech stack about it, almost a year ago now, which is really, really exciting, um, which is all about allowing for modularity um, when you build your DAO and that opens up a lot of customizability, um, ease of development, speed, and a lot more security. And and we've been pushing this forward ever since. Um, And I think what's exciting is that a lot of the projects even here in this chat today um, and in the LST space in the liquid staking space um, all have something in common, which is there's a lot at stake. (laughs) Um, Um, Which, you know, is the fact that there's a lot of money at stake and the entire network is at stake. Um, you know, Lido, who uses our, our our old contracts, for example, has, you know, nearly 33% of um, of all the staked ETH, and that's governed on Aragon contracts. And all of these projects, Diva here, Obol, uh, likewise, have a lot at stake, um, and it's great. And they're the type of projects that need to be using, um, you know, true on-chain governance as they get bigger and, and, and you know, more is at stake. And so that's where we come into play. And so we have a lot of great partners in the space. And I finally thought, okay, enough is enough. Um, we at Aragon need to do our part. And it's not just about decentralizing the network. Um, that's great. But why are we decentralizing the network? And for us at, at Aragon, that's actually helping to secure the future of DAOs, right? For us, you know, DAOs rely on the decentralization of the Ethereum network. Um, and without an unstoppable network, DAOs themselves, you know, are unstoppable. And so decentralization ensures that this network and is censorship resistant, is capture resistant. And we know if there's one chink in this armor, you know, it could eventually be exploited. And so we have to do our part. If we want DAOs to survive, if we want true on-chain governance to continue to grow and proliferate through all these wonderful organizations, well, then the network has to be secure. And so let's do our part. Let's basically ensure that every single Aragon contributor um, is participating, that they all have uh, a node, they all stake at home. And, you know, the great thing is, is with some of the great technology through um, Obel here, who will speak in a minute, through Diva as well, we're making that a lot more accessible. You know, furthermore, obviously, we can decentralize our own Aragon infrastructure if our entire team are running their own nodes, um, whether that be running a backend or using a long latency service. Um, to decouple vote actions from their timestamps, which is something to ensure voter privacy. There's a lot more we can do. And at the end of the day, this is a great, you know, activity for us as contributors to have fun, to work together, to hashtag squad stake or hashtag team stake, and to do our part. So that's really where it all came from. We got in touch with our good friends um, uh, at Dapnode, uh, Lansky here, who um, Aragon ended up giving a grant to long, long ago in 2018, which I think was the second grant program in Ethereum. And I thought, okay, let's let's get this um, going again. Let's get this partnership going again. Let's see if we can get nodes in everybody's hands and working with some great partners around space. So yeah, that's really where it came about. Um, and looking forward to hearing you know everybody speak today. Thank you. And as part of the team, I'm very excited to have my own node in my hands and having this kind of uh, team effort and the solidarity around it and the encouragement. Uh, is going to be very helpful to get it <laughs> up and running because I do think it can be a little bit nerve-wracking. I'm sure not the only one. Uh, so I would love to bring Lansky on from Dopnode to introduce yourself, introduce Dopnode, and introduce you know nodes and the hardware behind this this initiative. Hey, thank you. 
Yeah. Okay. So yeah, my name is Lansky. I am the project lead at DAP Nodes, and yeah, we've been uh, we've been helping people run nodes since since 2018. Yeah, since uh, since that uh, Aragon grant. Actually, fun fun uh, fun note. We deployed the Aragon package manager contracts before Aragon because we needed it to manage the the packages the the basically the the dap store of dap node and it's still governed by these contracts that we deployed really early 2018 but anyway um yeah so going back to nodes i'm i'm actually really excited that that you've decided to do something like this because um i've been talking about community staking in the past like I, I, this is my my last my talks in the last six months have all been about community staking about how can we bring together <laughs> the different tiers or the different layers of the full stack which are like basically a a community or a team then the uh, hardware where it runs then the software that runs on this hardware and finally the liquidity where it, where this liquidity comes from right and um the, the the team staking project basically is the first one that brings together um everything that brings together all the parts there's there are some dvt projects like uh dvt stakers in kenya um the eat kipu project that just came out that just came up right now that just came online but they're on testnet right um and uh and we're we're bringing together this uh, in a way that that is sort of like where instead of like having this community staking where the community gets together, uh, runs hardware thanks to DAP node, um, puts the software on it, which can be Diva, Obol, um, and then gets the liquidity from either Diva or from uh, their own liquidity, like in the case of Aragon. Um, uh, yeah, so 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 basically really excited to to have this happening right now and to be able to make sure that this stress that uh that jessica you were talking about make sure that the stress about like this this nerve-wracking thing like oh hey i'm not particularly technical i am not a uh, a person that uh that that's not a developer it's not a it's not a devops it's not a, a person that that knows or that that if i know if i can maintain um this this hardware running well that's where we come in that's where we bring the the hardware that's where we bring dap nodes um and dap nodes are made so you don't have to touch command line whatsoever it gives you a nice ui to to organize it gives you a great community to have all the support if something um that goes wrong and it's bound to go wrong at some point um so so yeah we're we're, we're happy to bring this part of the puzzle and to also facilitate the ease of installing that software, right? Both uh, Diva and uh, and Obol, you can use Dapnode to install this software with a couple of clicks, and a lot of the pre-configuration just just comes done in uh, in the Dapnode for you. So yeah, that's pretty much it. Great, we do love a good no code UI, <laughs> which is what we're we're working on with the the Aragon app. But that just makes you know this technology more accessible for everyone. And I should have introduced you as a longtime friend of, of Aragon. And I do love these stories that go back to the origins of the projects and the early days and that kind of bring the, the community back together um, again and, and kind of working together over time in all of these different, different ways. Um, it's a really great thing to see. Let's bring on uh, Brett and Max from Obol. If you can introduce yourselves, introduce Obol and, and what you do in your broader squad staking initiative, um, that'd be great. Yeah. Hey, everyone. Thanks, Jessica. Really happy to be here. Um, my name is Brett. Uh, I lead growth for, for Obal Labs. Uh, I'll let Max in, maybe introduce himself uh, when, he, when he speaks up next. Um, but just to kind of jump in to Obal. So as you mentioned, Obal enables squat staking on Ethereum. Uh, and we do this with a primitive called uh, distributed validator technology, which essentially enables a single validator to be run on a cluster of nodes. Uh, it could be four, seven, 10, or more. Uh, each of the clusters can be run either by uh, a squad of different solo stakers, home stakers, you know, in the case of 
uh, team staking here. You know, each of the uh, individual contributors to Aragon or core team members can each be running a node that works together as a uh, as a squad. Uh, this could be a squad of professional operators, or you could have a single operator running a squad of machines, uh, even. And really, the goal of the project is to make uh, the Ethereum network much more resilient, uh, much more secure, much more decentralized. And in doing so, you know, Obol is the only DB middleware uh, on mainnet today, uh, which means that it could be applied and used by um, any current or future staking setup. Right? So the project came out of um, early uh, ETH2 work uh, done from consensus. And really, uh, our two founders uh, who were ex-consensus uh, contributors, um, they identified some of the potential centralization problems that could exist with proof of stake. Um, you know, the fact that every validator is running 32 ETH on a single machine creates a really high barrier to entry and also makes it quite risky, right? To run, you know, what, what is it today? Uh, last time I checked 70, 80 K USD worth of stake on a single machine. Uh, and it also makes that, uh, single, uh, that single machine creates a single point of failure uh, that makes it very easy to go offline or fail. Um, and so this high barrier to entry, this riskiness that you're talking about, this nervousness, right, naturally pushes people to delegate stake to others and also creates a trust barrier, even for the largest, um, you know, staking entities, uh, because they have to trust that the operators running their stake um, is, is going to be you know, buttoned up, it's going to be secure, things are not going to go offline. And so that trust barrier also creates a natural centralization effect, even to um, stake desk delegated. So squad staking, squad staking solve these issues uh, by spreading stake out across a squad um, and also creates redundancy. Uh, so as long as two thirds of the nodes within a cluster are up and running, that validator will, will be operating normally. And so even if you know, in a team stake setup, one or two of your nodes go down, um, that validator will still be operating normally. And so you have that, you know, kind of fault tolerance built in to the validator itself. And that improves the res resiliency of individual operators, uh, but also uh, kind of offers opportunities now. Because once you've reduced that uh, initial riskiness, uh, once you've reduced that um, kind of offline risk, you now increase the opportunities for more solo stakers to participate. And also it strengthens the network as a whole. You can imagine you can now have uh, squads, uh, you know, running different clients uh, for a single validator uh, to improve client diversity. Uh, these can be located in different geographies. So you improve geo diversity. Uh, you can be running on cloud and, um, you know, home uh, stakes. And so you have infra diversity. And so ultimately, really, the goal is to decentralize the network as a whole and to strengthen the entire, um, you know, uh, consensus layer of Ethereum. But, uh, yeah, really excited to, you know, be supporting uh, this team staking um, effort because I think the more participation we can get from solo stakers and, you know, hopefully start a trend with uh, people, uh, what their core teams and, and contributors running their own stake and setting up their own uh, clusters and, and squads. Uh, I think it'll um, help to strengthen the ethos of Ethereum as a whole. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you for that very thorough overview um, of your role in the space and the, the technology um, that you're building and how it works. Uh, we'll have Diva on now. We have Myra and I believe Dennis as well, um, who will be coming up to speak. Yes, thank you um, for introducing. Um, and also, uh, just wanted to say that it's so great to hear, um, just honestly, even the past two, um, Paul and um, Brett speak about all these topics that we're all trying to tackle. Um, because obviously, uh, so my name is Myra, I guess I didn't introduce myself as the first thing. Um, and also, if Dennis doesn't come, come up here as well, we are part of the epic uh, marketing team that is supporting Diva um, and sharing all the great news with Diva there. Um, but obviously, um, the main issue that we're all attempting to tackle here is uh, the current staking trend leading to more centralization. Um, honestly, just to put more a few numbers to it, um, more than 50% of the current Ethereum staking power is controlled by only the top three pools. And even further, 91% of these are permissioned or centralized themselves, which only leaves really 9% for us to centralize options. So here we are, Oval and Diva representing the minority. Um, but 
essentially on Diva's side, Diva tackles this issue by building what we what we say is the most pure way of staking, where staking and operating are essentially operating in a in a linear flow, um, making the network more trustless, resilient, and censorship resistant through its DVT. Obviously, we're going to go through these topics a little bit later, um, and obviously, like that's the whole point of team staking is to learn about what these different elements really mean and what they mean to decentralization. Um, but Diva's unique difference essentially is that it no lowers the barrier to operating a node to one ETH, actually less when we launch on mainnet, um, and features randomized dis um, key distribution in its native DVT. Um, so staking obviously typically um, works in the same traditional way with Diva, with one Diva ETH equaling one ETH. But we actually have vaults right now that are open that if you participate prior to mainnet, they compound these things. So these are just a few opportunities that, you know, are, are given by um, the the level that we're attempting to, um, you know, like essentially democratize staking. Um, but the bottom line is that a hub for Diva, we are essentially building, as I mentioned, the purest form of decentralized staking. And I know that Paul Lansky actually mentioned that there are these different layers um, that make up this, I mean, essential uh, decentralization sandwich. I don't know if we want to call it a sandwich. I don't know if that kind of doesn't put it as, you know, seriously into perspective, but uh, Diva is attempting to be the layer two of staking. Um, so yeah, I mean, not to go to, too much into too many topics before we get into it, but yes, just introducing from the Diva side. I like sandwich. Also love sandwiches. <laughs> Thanks, Myra. And yes, two very thorough overviews of the technology. So um, we'll try to just dig deeper as we continue the conversation. Um, but throwing it back to, to Lansky and DAP node um, into just a question of why empowering people to stake from home and the different um, elements that make that important. As, as a mission and as, as work to do to basically get as many nodes um, out there into, into people's home. Can you speak to that a little bit, a little bit more? Right. I mean, um, Ethereum, Ethereum has many flaws. Um, but one thing that we as a community as, uh, have always tried to do, and particularly since the, since the very design of Ethereum, is that Ethereum has always tried to be very, very, very conscious of decentralization. And uh, ETH2, it was designed to be decentralized. It was designed to be very tolerant. When, when the 32 ETH limit that now we find quite high, well, I remember in the first, in the first documents that I was reading um, back in back in when I was young, um, the initial amount that was thrown around was 1,500, which wasn't that, that much economically back then. Um, but this was lowered down because it was supposed to be uh, very affordable. And also one of the considerations that we take into account every time we want to do a protocol upgrade is what is the trade-off that we are taking right now before we can, uh, so if we include this new feature in terms of what is the hardware overhead that we're going to be putting onto solo stakers? Because, you know, like we could have something that is really, really fast, really, really efficient, that can, that can do many, many transactions per second, but then uh, it needs to run in a, a 20 gigabits per second uh, connection and with uh, pro, uh, like a very high very high spec server like uh, solana for example and i'm not saying that solana is bad worse better i'm i'm saying that the trade offs that we have taken in the design of ethereum are to take into account that it needs to be run by people it's a network owned by the people. And this is extremely important because if we want it to be sort of this cyberpunk network that consists or makes up the back end for all the un oops, for all the uncensorable applications that we can build on top of it, then we need normal people to be able to run it because it's normal people who have a disproportionate disproportionate uh, effects on the resilience of the Ethereum network. 
and hear me out, this is what I mean when I say a disproportionate amount. If you put one more validator in Coinbase, one more validator in Coinbase basically means that there's one more validator key in the same providers. I can't remember which is the, the infrastructure provider for Coinbase. I think it's Kiln or I, I can't remember, but there's one more validator in the same server, in the same company that's probably in the United States. And if the United States wants to um, sort of censor or enforce some sort of um, censorship like it already does with OFAC, by the way, uh, I'm not talking about hypotheticals. I'm talking about a very real case of censorship that's happening. Um, it is very easy for them to just go and tell the infrastructure provider that they should not validate these type of blogs or that they should um, block here or 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 uh, or just basically stop Ethereum uh, completely. So when we create another node, so that's for one node in Coinbase, for example. When we create a node in a solo position, we're doing we're creating a node at a at a at a home setup that it is very hard to track that it's outside of a data center that um, is not subject to the same um, uh, geographical limitations of a, the big infrastructure providers that could be in a different country that could be in a different network that could could be under the jurisdiction of a different um, government, um, and it could be maybe about a government that doesn't care about Ethereum or that doesn't want to censor Ethereum or whatever. So basically, decentralization is important. And the biggest contributor to decentralization is the home staker. Not to say, finally, the, my last point for this topic is not to say that if the network is owned by the people, the revenue or the benefits of running this network should also be owned by the people. And yes, there are economies of scale to, of running many, many validators. But since it is designed for normal people to be able to run it, people should own this data. People should own the ETH and should own the revenue of um uh, of ethereum and that that reminds me of uh, actually uh, since we're speaking about since we're, since we're with obol here uh, one of the first um uh, touch points that i had with obol it was i think it was uh, colin the founders uh, the founder of obol uh, one of the founder of obol um a piece on ethereum being sort of an internet bond meaning that ethereum generates value and you can buy it as a bond and it gives you yield um, by generating this, this revenue, right? And uh, Ethereum, it is this, and you can own these bonds by owning a validator. Whatever the, 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 um, the network generates, you can own it and you can receive it. You can get your part of the value that is generated on Ethereum if you run a validator. And if you're a normal person, that is extremely positive for you. Yeah, that makes a ton of, ton of, ton of sense. And I think the interesting point is, is I go back to the tragedy of the commons um, and the fact that it, it seems human nature that it's, it's not enough that we need to do a little bit each in order to secure ourselves. And that seems to be somewhat playing out in the space here where we don't have enough at-home stakers because some would argue the incentives are not there to do that. Some would argue that, well, you're missing out on, on airdrops. Uh, you know, you're not getting enough yield compared to the cost of the unit and the cost of actually um, running a node. Um, obviously now it's interesting yesterday with the, the very um, contiguous Starkware um, uh, airdrop where some uh, at-home stakers, I think all at-home stakers um, were eligible to receive some of this airdrop. I think we may see a shift in that now, but what is your sort of, Response to that, um, Max, uh, Lansky, Diva, anybody. What are your sort of your your response to that? Like, what what can we do like to incentivize people more? Like, we've decreased the bond, okay, made it easier. The DAP node units are becoming stronger, okay. 
Um, but people still don't think that that incentive is enough. What is it going to take? Could what it's going to take is a black swan. People react a lot, a lot mm, faster to negative events than to positive events. But uh, but I'm going to let the the others speak a little bit as well. Yeah, I mean, I can maybe jump in here. Um, so I'm Max from from Obol. I'm a content and communications manager. But I think I think part of the question here is is whether or not Ethereum should kind of like h- how much of a role the Ethereum protocol itself should play in diversifying itself. Because uh, right now the Ethereum protocol, you know, there's correlated slashing, which kind of incentivizes uh, client diversification, or at least disincentivizes, you know, everyone using the same client. So that kind of big stick of, you know, if you're getting slashed at the same time as everybody else, that's kind of encouraging people to diversify their clients, right? But there's no protocol level incentivization or disincentivization from everyone running, you know, on the same continent in the same data center, or what have you. So, you know, I don't think anyone is is out there proposing that we build some kind of like more detailed incentivization or disincentivization into the Ethereum protocol so that it becomes more decentralized. Uh, but what we're what we're left with now is like, you know, just the marketplace playing out, economies of scale playing out, uh, big players like Lido kind of you know taking the lion's share. Um, I don't know even where I stand personally if if I think that Ethereum should be somehow aware of the location of validators and you know be rewarding validators that are alone in the data center or you know a minority on on that continent. Um, I feel like that's a pretty big topic um and i don't really hear that conversation happening yeah just to jump in here and give my two cents you know i think um the social layer of ethereum plays a huge role in this um i think you see trends actually uh recently um about kind of the pressure to decentralize i think you see events like the client diversity topic that you know was in Kind of the the the, the uh, you know Ethereum Twitter sphere um, and, and made its rounds. Um, I think you see uh, larger liquid staking protocols trying to decentralize. Um, you know, I think you see Lido at least making an effort towards decentralization around the node operator set uh, with uh, Simple DVT, um, which is you know the first additional module in V2 that we're working on with them. Um, to bring in more community stakers into their node operator set. Um, uh, we're also working with other, you know, liquid staking protocols ar- ar- around that. Um, so, you know, I, I think I think there is social pressure there. Now, with that said, I think the economics of solo staking still needs to be figured out. Um, I think today, uh, if you just factor in the cost of hardware, factor in the cost of um, of internet and 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 et cetera. Like there is, especially as you start to lower that that bond, um, there are still things to be figured out around how do you make the economics work out that makes it profitable for solo stakers to to join um, from from all places. And so, I think there's still a ways to go. You know, I think you know the the work that Dapnode is doing, that Diva is doing, and others around how how do we continue to lower that cost, to lower that hardware requirement. Um, is going to go a long way towards figuring out the economics, um, but uh, I think once that's figured out, you'll see a lot more people jump on board. And, and the final thing I'll say, I, I, I think there's a lot of regions of the world that are underdeveloped when it comes to solo staking. You know, um, I think Lansky mentioned uh, DV stakers, which is, you know, somebody working with us uh, to set up nodes in, um, in, uh, in, in Africa. Uh, and I think there is more and more opportunities and more interest from regions like Africa, Southeast Asia, South America, um, to have more staking presence. And I think solo stakers play a huge part in this. And so, you know, more education and more outreach to those regions of the world, I think will also go a long way towards um, contributing to the decentralization of the network. Yeah, thank you for um, kicking off this this line of questioning, uh, Anthony, and for the thoughtful responses on that. And there is, you know, the hard, the kind of harsh reality of the economic incentives and these really big challenges of, of incentivizing people to participate in, in that, in this way, in, in the infrastructure. 
Um, but you know, we're all, we're all humans and there are also some intrinsic, you know, motivations. And I do think a lot of us in this space are here because we are mission aligned in, in the mission, the broader mission, the broader goals, the broader ethos of Ethereum. Um, and you know, there's a negative side of the polarity of that, that can look like these, you know, virtue signaling, um, wars and whatnot, but there's also the positive side of that, which is people coming together and this positive reinforcement. Um, and I'd love to hear more about the uh, impacts that you're seeing on the ground, making this technology more accessible um, between Diva, Obol, and and Dapnode in terms of the different initiatives um, that that you're driving. Things like squad staking. Are you seeing more energy behind it from like an intrinsic kind of excitement, uh, mission oriented um, place? And what are the the impacts of the these initiatives and and the kind of reception from the community or the reaction from the, the community at large on what you do? Uh, yeah, I can actually um, go first on this because we're actually really excited to have launched just two weeks ago with Nixo from ETH Staker and Stichosaurus um, for actually onboarding 30 and subsidizing 30 new operators into the space um, and using DVT, learning how to use DVT. And what that looks like um, is essentially a curriculum, an eight week curriculum where each week they go through different um, different parts of learning. Um, it definitely is quite educational. All have never operated a node before. And we had we had over 100 applicants from the over 30 countries that are included um, in this in this um, cohort and hopefully more in the future. Um, but definitely seeing excitement behind it because, I mean, it's absolutely that that point that you're talking about, which is access, um, because although we are building such such um, niche things, such niche technology that seemingly help, you know, in every single way. You know, how are we continuing to build better if we don't allow um, more people in on the conversation? Because, I mean, as we're mentioning these things, we're saying, you know, like we need to reach out to all these different countries. It's like, who's who's having these conversations? Where are these conversations happening? Um, how do we include more people in them? Uh, so I, essentially that initiative was the first step that we saw. At least it's the first of its kind, just like team staking is essentially the first of its kind, um, kind of encouraging your own team to participate in uh, the the um, basically the groundwork and foundation of building Ethereum at its um, at its most re resilient um, possible point. Um, this it, I definitely am seeing more excitement behind it. I think everybody should be excited about it. Um, I even was saying that I don't understand how this wasn't a thing before. I just assumed that someone had done it already. Um, but it's great that we are all here. Um, having this conversation about people who otherwise might not have a voice around it. Um, people who are nervous about operating a node for the first time, people who have been doing it for a long time and have a lot of information to share. Um, this is absolutely social. It's absolutely, absolutely com more communal. Um, and actually we hosted our first um, operator gathering, operator huddle, as we called it. And for anyone not in the U S the word huddle, I guess is a little bit of a confusing word, but it's essentially just meant to gather um, for, for quick um, sharing of information you know, even though we're all doing something out here on the grounds and we're all doing possibly individually, possibly doing our own independent work. Um, but everyone can run a node on the side and everyone should believe that. But obviously, at the moment, we're still all building it up to that. Um, but I definitely am seeing a lot of excitement behind it and continuing to get more excited by the day. Yeah, just to echo that point, I, we definitely see a lot of excitement as well um, in the community. The, the one thing I'll add is, I think one of the things that puts um, solo stakers at a disadvantage when it comes to opportunities is also just credentialing. You know, it's it's much easier for a figment, a block daemon, a kiln to, you know, uh, because of their reputation and brand, uh, have people trust stake to be deployed there. Um, and this goes from, you know, people directly staking to even liquid staking protocols using them as operator sets, right? Um, for solo stakers, that type of credentialing is much harder to to earn um and frankly you can't prove your experience you can't prove that you said you know it, it people will have to trust your word that you've run a node for five years you know and, and you're experienced in, in doing so so i think one thing that's missing in the industry is, is credentialing also for uh, solo uh stakers and so you know one of the things that we're trying to do is to kind of fill in that gap as well we've introduced uh something called the opal technic credential uh which starting with at, at least dbt experience is is meant to basically prove 
on chain with a soul bound token um, that, uh, you know, a, a particular solo staker has experience running, um, running DVT and running nodes, and they were able to do so at a certain level of performance. And so I think more, uh, you know, initiatives in that area um, and more social uh, acceptance of just uh, the experience of solo stakers will also go a long way. And so that's also something that we're seeing. And we, we've seen a lot of excitement and uptake in, in the community uh, on that as well. Great. And I mean, education, this like, capacity building um, is an important is an important part of this and in our internal program too. And we're excited for the sessions that you'll all be hosting for our team, um, which is part of this program and um, getting just ourselves up to speed and learning about the technology. And hopefully we can also work towards some of these credentials. Um, and part of this from the, the team building standpoint, back to these intrinsic motivations, I'd love to Anthony to talk about this a little bit is just remote team culture. I think this pulls together kind of this interesting nexus between getting nodes in people's home distributed geographically, um, but also just the culture in teams and, and this as, as that kind of exercise. Do you have some thoughts to share on that, Anthony? Sure, yeah, I, I, I think it's super important. I think a lot of us probably in this room work completely remotely, um, working with teammates all across the world, um, some of them actually don't even get to work with like super, super closely because maybe they're on a totally different team working on something totally different. And so I think this is a great way to get back to sort of like, you could say, uh, all of our roots in this industry. It's like getting back to the base technology, ensuring that that's stable and working together to figure that out. And I think what I'm excited about is to go through the process. And I think a lot of people at Aragon are excited to go through the process. Of course, we have some stakers already, um, you know, within the teams, probably people who are more on the sort of on the technical teams, um, but those who aren't are, I think, actually the most excited to like get involved, get their hands dirty and like make an impact at that level. Um, and so for us, just, you know, going through that entire sort of process, I think is what's going to be really, really fun. Know that we're doing something great, know that we're going to get rewarded for it. I think all of that sort of works well together and know that it has like, uh, it, it will have an impact on actually protecting our product. You know, we are trying to build unstoppable organizations. We have been since 2017. Um, and that, as I said earlier, only works if the network itself is unstoppable. Um, and I, so I think it's just like a really easy, fun way, I hope it's easy, uh, to work together to, to actually say that like, yes, we're helping build unstoppable organizations. Not only are we building the technology for that, not only are we building a great user experience for that, but we're actually securing the entire network that does that. So I would definitely love to hear more from both Diva and Oval about like what kind of process that looks like um, for a, a squad staking group or team staking group. Um, what does that look like? What's that process look like to getting from zero to 100? Yeah, I can maybe um, jump in here with uh, kind of our take on this. So um, we've kind of purposely designed our product as infrastructure agnostic. So you know, it's more of a technology than, than a product, really. Um, and we're kind of relying on, you know, teams like yourselves to, to, to run with that and, and create these uh, initiatives. Um, so the DVT solution that we have is, is a middleware. Uh, it sits in your normal client stack. So if you're familiar with already running an Ethereum, uh, Ethereum node, a validating node, then you're really not going to need to make any changes to the clients you're using. You're just going to add our Karen client is what we call our middleware client. Um, and that's going to sit in between the consensus and uh, the validator clients and kind of, um, you know, communicate with the other the other nodes in your cluster. So really from, you know, the point of view of someone who's, who's looking to get involved, um, it's just a matter of like finding who your cluster mates are going to be. So in your case, you know, your employees are going to be uh, coordinating with each other. Um, they're going to be sharing their addresses that they're going to be using. They're going to be um, creating a identifier, an ENR uh, for their node, and they're going to be running a DKG together. Um, but really, once you're up and running, it's it's pretty much the same uh, kind of day-to-day -day operation as as any anyone's uh, who's familiar with running nodes is is already familiar with. So, um, you know, obviously, you can use something like a like an all-in-one DAP node uh, if those integrations are there. But you can also just use um, whatever infrastructure you've been using until now. Um, so that's kind of 
you know, been our our way to build something that's composable. Um, so, you know, we offer a launchpad UI where people can spin up a distributed validator, but we also offer, for example, an SDK and an API so people can kind of build products on top of Obol. Um, you know, we're not trying to compete directly with liquid staking protocols. We're not trying to keep compete directly with, um, you know, completely built out products. So we're really excited about initiatives and, and people kind of running with the technology and building on top of it, you know, using it to to create squads. Um, so that's been kind of our our perspective. And, uh, you know, we're hoping to really build a, a technology that's composable and infrastructure agnostic and, and just see what people do with it. Yeah, and then I can um, kind of give information from the Diva side. Um, so the way that we view um, teams or squads or clusters is a little bit different um, because the way that Diva works in its DVT um, is we are all, we're also building um, a native DVT that's not on any specific layer, um, but the way that um, these keys are distributed for the validator is actually completely random. Um, so basically, if you would be for example, the team would be learning how to use Diva and use DBT for the first time. Essentially, you would get set up with your node, um, and that looks similar uh, as well to Obol, where we have um, actually a DAP node package coming out pretty soon, really exciting. Um, but Or you can set up on your own, uh, download Diva on your very own node that you have already, or an absolutely new one. Um, and basically, you would set up your validator, um, and then you would be distributed one key of um, I believe 16 keys I be is the number that we are at right now. But um, so you don't really need to worry about keeping your validator keys safe um, because they're not really existent. Um, the true benefits really come from the lower risk of penalties that solo stakers face, um, primarily due to technical issues such as software bugs, hardware malfunctions or power outages, all of those things that um, can send nodes offline. Um, but actually, in the unlikely case of five knowing, nodes going down, even in a cluster, for example, um, um, but for example, after a faulty Ethereum client update, which is not as unlikely as we've seen recently, the remaining 11 actually can still perform their validation duties. Um, so this increases uptime by like 95%, but also without the more going into the way more technical side of it. Um, the way that we view it is that this this form of technology being way more censorship resistant and resilient um, is based on, you know, no one really outside of you being able to control any specific large number of keys and or one validator key in and of itself. So you'd be basically a view this squad staking and team staking as obviously an extremely um, great way to learn in its community aspect and social aspect as well. Um, but operating a node should be as simple as, you know, one, two, three, it should be simple in every sense now, um, and besides the um, the initial setup of the hardware, obviously the initial hardware cost, um, but from zero to 100, it really can be from one day, like take you from one day, you know, and then you can begin receiving validator keys. Uh, so yeah, without going too technical into it, it should be pretty simple. Um, however, very random key distributions. So yeah, no one in charge of everything all at one time. Great, thank you for the the rundown from from both. Um, I think this kind of leads into next steps or or future visions or thoughts just for the decentralization of Ethereum generally and and getting nodes into people's um, hands and getting this technology um, into more hands. Uh, and I, Lance, I would give you a soapbox any day. So giving you this <laughs> the soapbox back for your kind of future vision and next steps um, on what can continue to to move this forward. What could continue to move move this forward? Um. Yeah, I mean, honestly, we're we're in the right thing. Like, there's 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 exciting developments now in Ethereum. As I was saying, uh, there's always people thinking, um, "Hey, what is the next upgrade on Ethereum, and what are the trade-offs for this?" Right. One of the things that I'm that I'm excited about is the um, so one of the limitations of solo staking that exists right now. And it's also one of the limitations that Obol have and the Diva will have, is that you cannot have all of the computers in the world speaking to 
uh, to all of the rest of the computers in the world. This is a networking problem and it's just not possible, right? So we, we have uh, things in the protocol right now, like the increase of tax effective value that uh, will be, we'll be able to consolidate a lot of uh, the validators, a lot of the validators stake. And when you generate 32 ETH, you will not necessarily have to go and create a new validator. You could just like add these 32 ETH on top of another validator, right? So the barrier of entry keeps being the same, 32 ETH. Um, but thanks to Diva, it can be a lot lower. And thanks to Oval, it can be a lot lower as well if you, uh, you spread uh, among the squad. Um, but not only this, but your your stake will be able to keep growing, and you uh, and it will be like if you have more than one validator, you have a bigger validator, right? Um, so I'm I'm very excited for this because this is for me the right way of going about uh, decentralization right now. There's also like um, I think it will it it basically validates this sort of team staking or squad staking that, that we're talking about because we will need the more important a validator is. So the more ETH there is, the more um, it'll be uh, liable to have more uh, more duties, et cetera, et cetera. So the more important is to keep this uptime up. So the more important is to not be alone as, like, as a solo staker, for example. Um, if you miss uh, some some time or yours offline sometime this will be more impactful than it is right now so in one sense this is a good thing that that we're having the increase of max effective value and in the other it could be a bad thing if if you are uh, down for some reason but thanks to team staking or squad staking um this basically has all of the benefits of max effective value um without the drawdowns or the bad sides of it. So basically, I think we're 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 on the right path. Um, we're doing the right thing, and the direction in which Ethereum is going right now basically seems to validate that even the people that are solo staking right now, they would do good of moving into some sort of DVT setup as well. So what's next? I mean. What's next for you guys is to turn on your DAP nodes and start setting up these validators. And we'll be here. We'll be here to help you. But just just so you know, you're doing the right thing. And the direction that Ethereum is taking right now is validating the direction that you are taking action, the actions that you're taking with your money, with your ETH, um, and with your technology as well. I love that. I love that. What's next is turn on your DAP node. <laughs> That's a good pitch. On that note, um, how can other organizations get involved? There are other organizations here that want to put team staking together. We've put our, our playbook out and, and wrote it out. Um, but I would love to hear from all of you, from Ulansky on the DAP node side and also Obel and Diva. Like, How can organizations either reach out to you, learn more about this, um, get started? Yeah, definitely. So definitely reach out. Reach out because we can. We're sort of looking at team staking as a as a, as a, some sort of like initiative or or product where you get like an end to end solution. Um, as as I was saying, we you as somebody that wants to be involved as a company as a community uh, that wants to be involved, you bring in the people that will operate these machines that will operate the DAP nodes, um, they don't even have to be like DAP nodes or you don't even have to buy the DAP nodes from us. You can just uh, install it in your own machines, et cetera, et cetera. We're free open source software uh, project. So um, basically get in touch with us and, and we have the ability to create that project for you as sort of like a turnkey project. We, we help you choose which solution that's available on DAPNode, which software solution, Diva, Obol, um, is, is best for you. And we can train you, we can bring the, um, the, our expertise and we can bring the support for if anything goes wrong to be able to support you in your journey. Um, this, the, in this way, you get yield out of your ETH, you get a team experience, and you get decentralization for Ethereum. So yeah, basically get in touch.
and say thanks to Aragon for being the trail trailblazers. For yeah, just to, just to piggyback off of that 100%, uh, please also reach out uh, to, to Obel. You know, we're excited to basically get more community clusters stood up. Um, and, you know, we have packages with Dapno that are turnkey. Uh, we have, you know, solutions depending whatever kind of hardware uh, you guys decide or software or solution you guys decide to run from a node standpoint. Uh, I would also add that um, we do have opportunities uh, as well if you don't have uh, requ requisite ETH uh, to be able to offer to people who are, uh, you know, wanting to build their experience uh, with running uh, validators. Um, you know, we, we're working with, uh, for example, Etherfi. Uh, they have what they call Operation Solo Staker uh, that allows people to basically run nodes even without a bond. Um, and even Simple DBT uh, with Lido that's about to launch is also bondless at, at this point. So. Um, even if you don't have ETH to stake and you just want experience running a validator, you know, you can do so. Uh, you can start with testnet and then move to mainnet eventually as well. But I think these on ramps to getting more people running validators is also critical. And we would love to develop that uh, with, with the ecosystem. Oh, uh, one last thing specifically, uh, our uh, yeah. social media manager, his name is uh, Green. Uh, he, goes, he goes by Greenpill. Uh, it's at uh, Take Greenpill on, uh, on Twitter, uh, as well as Farcaster. Uh, he is helping to organize all of our community clusters. So please reach out directly to him. Awesome. And I guess just to finish it off, um, I please, please um, follow us on Snake Diva. But also we have um, incredible new updates um, with our Diva operator testnet, which is absolutely now live. Um, and please, we encourage anybody um, who has already been testing on our testnet or is curious about it, um, just to reach out to us or to begin testing and offer any sort of feedback. Um, we welcome it, we invite it. Um, no question or no um, comment is a bad question or comment. We're obviously trying to build the most resilient um, and most decentralized solution, uh, liquid staking solution uh, for all of you and for everyone. So we welcome everybody as we are going to have new updates pretty soon and hoping to launch on mainnet um, end of Q1. Um, so that's very exciting. But also we encourage you to either reach out to us on Twitter or on Discord, but hashtag team staking. And honestly, you know what? We're working with, with Dapnode. We are open to any sort of new type of initiative. We're a DAO, you know, create your own initiative. We are um, absolutely in support of this trailblazing program um, because as it's been mentioned by everyone before, more more stakers, more operators really just helps build a network up, um, especially for Ethereum. We're trying to build a greater future for everyone. So reach out on Twitter, on um, on Discord with hashtag team staking, um, or I'm also my reverse on Twitter, um, or Dennis is here as well. Um, we welcome DMs <laughs> on this topic for sure. Um, and let's just get the conversation going. Let's keep it up. Thanks, Aragon, for hosting. Thank you. And I do see, Dennis, uh, you just were able to join as a speaker. Uh, and I'm yes, sorry for the, those technical difficulties. But Dennis, from, from Diva, I don't know if you have some thoughts you wanted to add or we're towards the end, but I'll, I will give you the floor um, if there's something that you want to share. Yes, we can. Excellent. Yeah. Um, so it's a, it's a great discussion that's moved all the way from you know devices to the future of Ethereum. And I think it's important to have these conversations. And um, I just want to maybe take a quick outlook into the future. Um, and um, I think in the short term, I envision that solo stakers will start realizing that pool staking is actually economically better uh, due to the reward smoothing effects that they will have. Um, and it's a great opportunity for Diva to help them migrate and realize the full potential of staking with less responsibilities, but without compromising on decentralization. So for example, Zapnode today powers what, um, 3,000 solo stakers or so, represented about 1% of all the stake ETH. So I think with this um, team sta hashtag team staking program, it's a great example of how um, it will be easy to switch and enjoy the benefits that we're discussing today. Uh, whereas in the long term, um, as a long term goal, I think um, uh, it would be great to find the balance between the convenience of centralized and um, sort of vulnerable solutions 
and uh, un untap the potential of truly decentralized and credibly neutral ones like like Ziva. So one approach is to make sure that none of the LSTs get outsized as we are seeing now. And this will allow allocation to multiple feasible staking solutions that are scalable and trustless uh, as a way to reduce uh, the risk uh, at large. So just my two cents to our discussion today. Great, thanks. I'm glad you got the opportunity to join and, and get some thoughts in towards uh, the end. To learn more about this initiative, um, you can go to the Aragon um, mirror page. So we have a whole write up and please also reach out to our partners, Dapnode, Diva and Obol. Um, you got the information on where to, to reach out. You know, we're all part of something new. Team staking is a new initiative. So it is a good, a good opportunity to mint and to plant your flag that you're part of this initiative and that you're in this room and, and part of a really uh, exciting, so hopefully an, exci an exciting start to a broader movement. Uh, so thank you so much for joining us and have a great day.